So when people think about hacking, they often think about things like this. I'm back creating the firewall entropy. Now I'm reversing the flux capacitor polarity. We're in. But real hacking is actually a lot simpler than you might expect. I professionally monitor hackers, and that's anything from criminal ransomware organizations to nation states. And the most common hacks I see are actually some of the simplest. So I wanted to just kind of walk you through some of the most common hacks I see. Now, all of them have a very similar theme, and that is they are user focused. Most hacking is actually more tricking the user than exploiting systems. And that's not to say that zero day vulnerabilities don't exist. As you can see here, a full Android zero click goes for 2.5 million on Zerodium, an iOS one, 2 million, and even the local privilege escalations are $200,000. But the use of these kind of exploits is very few and far between, because this is just the acquisition price for Zerodium. They're then selling the bugs to either other brokers or directly to government for five to 10 times that amount. Now I've seen licenses for iOS capabilities where the government can hack like a, a couple of phones being sold for $10 million. So these are not the kind of things they wanna whimsically throw around. These are not the type of capabilities you want burned or you want to be using on anyone but the highest of value targets. Now probably the most common attack I see is the office macros. At some point in history, Microsoft decided, I think a text document should be able to run code. And then after that, everything was terrible. So essentially office documents have a built-in programming language that allows them to run code. So what attackers do is they make office documents that look like this. And then if you open it and click the enable macros button, it will infect you with malware. But the button is kind of confusing. It doesn't really explain why you shouldn't click it or what it does if you do. So a lot of documents just basically convince the users to click it and it's very, very easy. And then once they click that button, it's pretty much game over. The document can load malware onto the system and then the attacker can do whatever they like. Now, similarly, there is phishing. A lot of hacks are actually because the user gave their password to the attacker, just they didn't know they were doing it. And there's all kinds of different ways to fish users. There's the basic form where you enter your password into a site that looks something like this. And then there's more advanced stuff like OAuth token phishing and reverse proxies. But ultimately it is all the same thing where they are just tricking the user into giving access to their account without knowing it. And do you wanna know what's easier than finding a zero day exploit? It's finding an exploit that has already been found. As a matter of fact, most organizations do not keep their systems up to date. So attackers don't need to find the latest vulnerabilities or hire teams of geniuses to comb through code. They can just take something off of Google or GitHub and use it against companies' networks. And I've seen this happen on thousands of occasions. Network administrators will have servers that are not externally facing, which means it's not reachable from the internet. So they'll go, well, if it's not reachable from the internet, then no hackers are going to be attacking it. Therefore, I don't need to keep it up to date. And then what will happen is one of those office documents will get onto an employee's computer or the VPN gateway will be breached. And then suddenly the hacker has access to other systems on the network, at which point they can then use old vulnerabilities to hop onto different systems. So if you had say a domain controller, which is the most privileged machine in a network, and that wasn't patched and they got access to some low level employee machine with very little privileges, well, they could then run exploits against the domain controller and own the entire network. In fact, VPN exploits were very popular with ransomware groups for a while. Essentially the VPN sits on the edge of the network and it allows employees to connect into the network from other locations such as their home. And there are a bunch of vulnerabilities discovered in this software. So what did hackers do? Well, they took those old vulnerabilities and then they just scanned the internet for anything that is vulnerable. And of course they found tons of them. And then once they got onto the VPN server, these devices are designed to allow users to log into the network from external systems. So they could just sit on the VPN endpoint and gather user credentials, at which point they could then log into the network. And this led to several very big corporations getting ransomware. And in fact, something you might find interesting to know is a lot of hackers in these criminal organizations are not good at hacking. They're just following scripts. And when I say a script, I don't mean like a bash script or a Python script. I mean a literal script. 
they have actual documents that just say, do this, then do this, then do this. And they just read through them. In fact, the guide script for one of the biggest ransomware operations in the world actually got leaked. So you can actually see the document they give to their employees and the steps it takes them through and what it tells them to try and what software and tooling it tells them to use. And often it really is just a case of getting a system that's infected on the network, be it by macros or a VPN exploit, and then running something like Mimikatz to dump credentials. And once the credentials are dumped, they can then basically pivot onto other systems and work their way up to the domain controller, at which point they basically have control of the entire network. And this is not movie grade hacking. This is just a script that really anyone with a basic tech knowledge can follow. And I'm not talking about low level script kiddies. I'm talking about some of the biggest hacking organizations in the world. And this can be criminals, governments, pen testers, red teamers. A lot of this hacking is very, very simple. Now there was a time I'd say maybe 10 or more years ago when hacking was very, very refined. You would have just like a single person or two people who would be running a hacking operation. They would build their own tools. They would build their own uh, exploits. They'd build their own extensions. But then people were like, why are we doing this? Why are we trying to be jack of all trades? And basically things followed the real world economy. We started splitting up into services just like how you have your cloud services and your delivery services, or you have hacking services. For instance, if you want your malware to be able to bypass any antivirus, well, there's a service for that. You just upload your malware to the service, it immediately comes back, and it's no longer detected by any antiviruses. Or if you want to use Microsoft Office macros to infect uh, company employees, well, there's a service that will make those for you. And there's services that will bypass two-factor authentication. They will even sell you access to company employees' computers or credentials. Everything has become so fragmented and service-oriented that you really just need money to start. And this isn't just criminal hackers. A lot of the good side of hacking is like this, and so is the nation-state hacking. I've seen nation-state hackers who are, again, just following a script. They're given some malware, they're given some tools, and then they're given a script that says, do this, do this, do this. You can actually find online incident reports of real hacks, and it will tell you what the hackers did, how they got access to the organization, how they uh, elevated their access. And a lot of it is really, really simple stuff. So if you're thinking you need to be some super amazing Hollywood style hacker to get into the industry and do good work, well, you're really, really wrong. A lot of these problems are really solving people problems, not solving technology problems. And sometimes it's both. Sometimes we can use technology to solve the people problems. But a lot of hacking is very, very non-technical. And that's the problem. We need to understand why does this non-technical hacking work and how can we solve the problem? So anyway, those are some of my thoughts on hacking in the modern world. So if you're psyching yourself out, saying you're not good enough, maybe I can't get into the industry, I would really rethink that.